Do you might remember last week where we checked out the Silverstone RM? Here's the deal. What you're about to see in this video didn't actually happen. And what I mean by that is not in the way you'd expect, but let's continue for a bit. A 4U rack mount case that allows you to install 360mm rads and you can check out our review. I'll put that in the description down below. But anyway, today is the day where we're actually putting hardware in it and we're going to deploy it. Yeah, we put hardware in, but <laughs> not this hardware. So let's take a look at the hardware, let's build it, and let's show you how this whole thing works. I suppose I should explain what's going on here. So about two weeks ago, whenever it was that I bought this case, a few days after that, I decided that I would build this new server. The problem being is I actually decided on a whole different arrangement of hardware that would go into this and I decided to scrap the whole video. However, when I was talking to some of our Discord members, they actually said that they wanted to see it anyway. Instead of me scrapping this entire video and it just being on the cutting room floor forever, I decided I would show you what I chose initially, it actually came out of our old server, and then why I decided to make this thing far more powerful. And it might be for reasons that you might think to do in your own home lab setup. Let's get back to it and I'll keep filling you in along the way. The whole system is already a fully operational system, so I'm not gonna be upgrading anything for now. I need to get this up and running again to see if my whole idea works. So for the motherboard, we've got the Gigabyte X570S Aero G. It's a fairly good X570 board and it's been running beautifully for a long time. The CPU underneath the cooler, which is a Noctua 3U cooler, is the AMD Ryzen 5 5650G Pro. So this is one of their professional processors. I don't even know how I got it. It kind of just rocked up one day and yeah, I've got it. The RAM is actually pulled out of my editing PC. It's 128 gigs of thermal take tough RAM. Uh, that was the whole plan all along as well was to put that RAM in here because this runs ESXi with a whole bunch of virtual machines. You might be thinking it's only a six core processor. The virtual machines don't need heaps of CPU cores but they need lots of RAM, right? That's the main thing to focus on here. For the storage for our virtual machines, I've got a two terabyte Samsung 870 Cuvo. Uh, that's all backed up and stuff onto the storage array as well. So that's just running the operating system. I prefer not to run it off an SD card or a SATA DOM or anything like that because I've got a bit more expandability and stuff with that. For the storage controller, this is an LSI controller. This is in IT mode. So TrueNAS sees everything plugged into this card and this is passed to a virtual machine, so it's not running anything on the metal. Now, one of the things that held this up was actually me upgrading the network card. This is a dual port Intel, I think it's an X520, so it's dual 10 gig. Uh, I wanted to add this in just for a bit of redundancy. I had a Mellanox Connect X3 in here. The problem was it doesn't work with ESXi 8, which we'll be upgrading to hopefully in this video if everything goes to plan. And this is on the HCL, so it should work. And if it doesn't work, I'll probably cut this bit out. There's also a stack of M.2 drives underneath the heat sinks that are used for caching. All the slots are full. Some of them are SATA, some of them are NVMe. So every slot is populated underneath the heat sinks. And for the fans, because I've decided not to change the cooling solution for now, because the idea is, I'm gonna switch this out to a Threadripper system with an ASRock rack motherboard later. But for now, because I'm not putting in a liquid cooler and using the standard air cooler, I'm just gonna put three Scythe Wondersnow 120 fans up the front of the case for intake. You still never explained why I scrapped the video, right? Well, the truth is I got kind of over filming it. I needed the system to run. I kind of had the feeling that by the time that I had completed the system that it would only last a couple days on the Ryzen 5 Pro before I swapped out the hardware anyway. And I just didn't think you guys wanted to watch that, but it got a little bit interesting, which is why we picked it up. I've got some really good explanations and reasons as to why it's different. Keep watching. Trust me, it's worth it. Okay, we don't have much space to look at the dish shelf here, but this is how I built it a bit earlier today. Essentially what we've done is I've used a SAS expander. I've used some fans that were in there already. The fans are hooked up to the back plane for all of the discs. 
As well as that, uh, if you want to take a look at how we're connecting this, we're using external SAS connectors. These plug into the breakout plate that's in the back of the server that we're putting together in a minute. And the way I've got the SAS expander working is, you know those mining adapters that people use to use their GPUs with like USB and stuff? Basically I've used that to power the SAS expander because it's a dumb device. It doesn't need any power whatsoever to run. So I've basically just powered that with SATA. I've jumped the power supply as well to power this all on. So basically flick the switch on the SFX power supply that I switched in because I didn't want to use a 2U power supply. They're a bit noisy. This one is very, very quiet and it gets the job done. In fact, I was using that power supply before. I've got two 60 mil Noctua fans that are just staying in there and they're all connected up to the back plane. So the fans will spin and they've got really good fan control built into that back plane as well. It's not just 100% all of the time. Yeah, so that's basically how I've done it. And this is how it looks. All cable management and everything like that. Not too exciting. Sorry, this is filmed on my phone, but that's the only way I could do it and fit it in the shelf properly. somewhat caught up on what I didn't use. Let's talk about what we actually did use. Obviously, I didn't use the Ryzen 5 Pro 5650G at all. Although it did work quite well, I actually decided to go Threadripper. And this is something that we've covered in the past. And so I actually went with the CPU that was in my backup editing PC, which is the Threadripper 3970X. It's a 32 core CPU. And I put that on the MSI TRX40 Creator. And basically I extracted the motherboard and CPU out of my backup editing PC and I threw it in the Silverstone RM44. To cool it, I used a 360 mil deep cool cooler. I think it's the LS720. The Scythe fans that I'd already installed, I actually just put them on the liquid cooler up the front. You're probably asking, why did you go with Threadripper even though you ran your other server for the longest time on a Ryzen 5? Well, Things have changed. A lot of the editing that I do, I either edit on a local machine with the storage card in my local editing PC, or I'll pull things over off the network off spinning Rust drives, right? Because I now have the M2 Pro Mac Mini, I found myself editing quite a bit on that as well to do just simple cuts of rushes through the day. So I don't have to fire up my editing PC all the time, which means I need faster storage. And with faster storage, we need more PCIe lanes because I'm going to be adding a storage card that we're going to be passing straight through to our true NAS scale virtual machine. But I don't have those drives yet. There's one other thing. I've added quite a few other virtual machines for other tasks that I do. And I figured that more cores is going to help in the long run. One thing about this whole setup that actually worked out for the better is the Ryzen 5 Pro can run quite warm and it was running quite warm with that Noctua cooler. It's supposed to be in a server rack with super good ventilation. Where my server is, it's pretty average. And I figured that I can do a couple things to make the Threadripper far more efficient. I changed the all core multiplier. All cores run at 2.8. I undervolted the CPU by quite a bit to reduce heat output and I used eco mode to limit the CPU to just 65 watts. That's right, ladies and gents. What does that mean? On a 360 mil liquid cooler, they're generally pretty quiet. I have now got a quiet and cool 32 core processor with all the PCIe lanes that I'm ever going to need. So it turns out that <laughs> I'm using less power, it's not running as hot, and I've got more things to play with and more things to expand with. I suppose you're wondering if my DIY disc shelf actually worked. Of course it worked. It worked flawlessly 
and does everything that I need it to do. So I'm pretty happy with the outcome of my DIY disc shelf. Showing you how the network is connected, I've got a copper DAC and some fiber going in the back as well. The only reason why I have it like that is because I had two servers up here before. One was connected with a copper DAC, the other one was with fiber. And now that I've removed both servers and this just one, I just plugged in what I already had provisioned for it. I also don't want to move the server from its home as well. So I kind of pulled it out a little bit and pulled the lid off so you can see kind of how it's all put together. You can see how I've got that back plate installed with the mini SAS cables connected up to the controller. You can't actually see the controller because it's just kind of right next to each other. That network card's in. I've got two free PCIe slots. They're both free by 16 PCIe slots. So if I need to do any type of crazy expansion, I'm not gonna have any issues with that. The Deepcool 360mm AIO that I mentioned as well, the LS720 is installed and I'm using those scythe fans up the front. I wish I could get in a little bit more, but it's just <laughs> a bit difficult, ladies and gents, because of the positioning of this server. But I thought I would show you what it finally looks like inside and how it's all plugged in. In. If you're not familiar with VMware ESXi, this is what the management interface looks like. The main reason why I decided to go with a hypervisor and ESX is because I'm really familiar with it from my professional career and it actually saves me having a GPU in the system. This is like a way to connect to it when it's completely headless. I hope that makes sense. This basically serves as a web interface for the whole system. As you can see, the system has already been up for 10 days at this point. So the footage that you saw earlier in the video is quite old. Here we've got the 32 core Ryzen Threadripper 3970X. It's running on the MSI board that I mentioned previously with 128 gigs of RAM. And there's a couple things that I haven't configured on here because this isn't connecting to a vCenter server. It's running as a standalone hypervisor. The interface actually shows us a few things that I was talking about earlier with limiting all core performance to 2.8 gigahertz. You can see that ESX actually shows us the capacity of total speed for the system in gigahertz rather than per core. The way we can calculate this based on the total capacity of gigahertz in the system is we can just go, 89.6 divided by 32 and that gives us 2.8 so it's showing us that all core performance is at 2.8 gigahertz thus reducing thermal output and power consumption and there's all the other stuff that i did going on under the hood as well for storage i'll just quickly run you through this it may or may not be interesting to you we've got a single two terabyte SSD that I showed earlier when we built the system. So it's the same Samsung Qvo drive. It's got a bunch of virtual machines on it. And we've also got an NFS share with a bunch of other stuff on here. This does backups and snapshots of the virtual machines that we use. And it does a couple other proprietary gear seekery things that I'm not gonna get into. I've got three virtual networks set up, all connecting to two virtual switches. So we've got our 10 gigabit external, which is basically anything that goes out to the network on vSwitch 0 as well as our management network that runs on vSwitch 0 as well and our internal network which is another virtual adapter I attach to some virtual machines if I want the virtual machines to talk to each other without going out over the network so it does switching inside the hypervisor I hope that makes sense to you guys our virtual machines do a couple things I'm not going to talk too much about what they all do this one here is our virtual machine for TrueNAS. So I can just click on that and you can see it right here. So this is our storage server running virtualized. Now, the way this is configured and actually ESX has got a quite a nice layout, even for people who aren't super familiar with it, is you can see that I've got a bunch of PCIe devices passed through to this virtual machine. This is that LSI card. I've also got two NVMe controllers that are passed through as well. And that's for SSD caching. When we add the additional storage card at a later date, I can just pass that card straight through to the virtual machine as well. So it's not a super technical setup, but it does everything that I need it to do. ESX gives me the opportunity to control everything without a monitor. And this is, this is normal stuff for people who are initiated with server stuff. But for people who haven't seen this before, 
this you might find this interesting. Now, there's a lot of questions that, that I'm sure you have about why I didn't use things like Proxmox or just using TrueNAS with the virtualization built in. A couple short answers. It doesn't do everything that I needed to do. And as I mentioned, I'm familiar with ESX because I used it in my professional career before YouTube. And the reason why I didn't use the virtualization inside TrueNAS is it's kind of crappy right now. It might get better over time. I would much prefer to have all of my virtual machines separate and not running on my storage server, if that makes sense. I'd rather run the storage server on the hypervisor. Now, logging into TrueNAS, you can just get a bit of an idea of how I've got it configured. This is a very basic TrueNAS deployment. The truth is this TrueNAS installation and deployment is for all of the working stuff that we're currently working on. So it does no backups or anything like that. It's not designed to do backups. It's literally working storage. We have another backup system and we've got offsite backups as well. So I've got two virtual adapters connected. I've got the 10 gigabit adapter for external networking. So basically any machine on a network can connect to it at 10 gig. I've also got that 10 gig network running internally between virtual machines. I've got it in a different IP range. I didn't VLAN anything because I don't want it to be too complicated because I'm going going to be changing some things on the back end of our network soon anyway. If you want to see how our VDEVs are set up, you can see here that we've got RAID Z1 with like eight drives on this one, RAID Z1 with four drives on this one. We've got a 500 gig NVMe M.2 SSD cache on both of them. This is all going to change as well when I get a bit more time. I honestly just haven't got around to it yet because I've got so much other stuff going on. But hopefully this gives you a little bit of an understanding of how I've got it set up for now. As you can see that I've only got six cores assigned to this virtual machine as well. As I add additional VDEVs, I will increase the core count on this too. But for now, six cores is more than enough. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. I actually really liked making this video and I like making this kind of content. The problem is, I don't know if you guys find this type of stuff interesting. I love making it. So please let us know in the comments if you want to see more content like this because I would love to give you as much of this content as humanly possible because I just, I love this kind of stuff. It's quirky, it's weird, it, it's really functional, and it does things that you think that you might not need, but maybe you do need something that does something like this. Obviously, probably not using a 32 core Threadripper, but having a little home server to do things like this can be a really fun learning experience if you're not versed in the enterprise space. And the good thing about this as well is you can teach yourself something new, you can learn something new, and it could eventually turn into a career if you love it enough. I love it. I love, I love the server stuff. Always have, always will. But let me know, please, if you want me to cover more of it, because we can make it happen. If you like the music you heard here, I make all of the music. It's available by clicking that join button right down there, down below. And get yourself subscribed if you're not subscribed for more weird, quirky content and videos that we may or may not scrap. <laughs> We've actually never shelved a video before. This is the first one, and I'm glad I, I came back to it and finished it. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy, Nick with Gear Seekers. You peek, we seek, and see ya, I guess. Hmm. I still think this video is kind of weird, but I hope you enjoyed it because I liked making it. Thanks for watching.